Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. It's a great honor for Alan and I to be here. We have tremendous respect for Montana, Montana's history, and especially the Idaho-Montana connections. And of course, one of the biggest Montana connections is the Nespers tribe. Alan, of course, former tribal chairman and, and a member of the tribe, and, and uh, my wife Connie is here, and, and she is uh, also a member of the tribe. Uh, I am not, people ask me one at a time, are you a member of the tribe? No, I'm a Welshman. I married, <laughs> I married in, but I was raised on the Umatilla Indian Reservation in Eastern Oregon, and I've lived on the Nespers Reservation for over 30 years with my wife, uh, Connie, and, and our friends and, and uh, my new relatives that I got after I got married. But I'm just gonna introduce our topic tonight we're so happy to be here, and we give you a Ketsi Yao Yao, and that's our uh, reservation way of saying thank you, and it kind of rhymes with cat's meow meow. That's what a tribal person told me one time. Just think of cat's meow meow, and you'll get the rhythm of the word right. And that helps, you know, little tips like that. But anyway, so cat's meow meow, and uh, really appreciate uh, being here in Montana. This is one of the nicest little venues we've had for the different talks we've given in the last couple of years since our, our book was, um, was released. Uh, <clears throat> we're gonna just go through a few things about, on our sources and, and really we worked uh, 11, 12, almost actually all together uh, off and on for about 15 years to get this book together. So in the hour that we have this evening, you know, we're gonna hit things pretty lightly and to kind of give you a smorgasbord uh, taste of the book. And uh, so we're gonna look at the sources a little bit and uh, then we are going to kind of focus on a couple of things. One of them, which the reviewers of the book so far have claimed is our biggest contribution, is a focus on the Ordway Junket. Most people don't realize the first non-Indians to enter Hell's Canyon uh, of the Snake River were three members of the Lewis and Clark um, outfit, and that was Ordway, Frazier, and Weezer. And so uh, we are gonna kind of focus on that uh, for a little bit, and then we're gonna bring up another little trail that didn't get much attention, and that's the Kamii to Weipe Trail, and that uh, it's not a very long trail, but it was very critical in getting them out of Kamii Valley, over the Bitterroots, and home uh, in 1806. One other thing that we are gonna mention that has not, getting, not, has not received much focus is the, what we called the Grand Council. Actually, I think Lewis called it the Grand Council with the Nez Perces, which was uh, May 12th of 1806, right in Kamii Valley, the valley where my wife was uh, born and raised. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's a story of an alliance between the United States government and the Nez Perce tribe. It was later solidified in a treaty, the Treaty of 1855. Many aspects of that were reemphasized in the Treaty of 1863. And many of the portions of the agreement, especially hunting, fishing, and gathering, are still recognized by the Nez Perce tribe today and by the United States government and by the federal courts that are looking at the uh, timber issues and fishing issues in the Pacific Northwest. So with that, I'd just uh, like to get started and say a little bit about our sources. Um, one of the most important sources is uh, the people, the Nez Perce people, and the, the ones that we are most thoroughly connected with, Alan's relatives and my relatives uh, by marriage. You want to say something about your dad? Yeah, this is my father. He was, uh, he served in World War I, and <clears throat> in the last few weeks of the war, he was in the trenches fighting, so he went through the, some part of the worst part of the war. But this was, picture was taken before he was shipped overseas. And, uh, Later, I'm the next to the youngest of nine children of my father. So everybody, uh, I'm the youngest right now. There, we've lost uh, 
four of our, our family. And what he would do when I was younger, uh, we'd be go hunting or fishing, you know, and then he'd start talking. And this is all oral history. You know, he'd talk about this, uh, you know, the treaty times, and then he would talk about the new creatures that came to this earth or this area of the earth. And what he meant by that was the white people. We, he said we called them creatures because we didn't know who they were and what they were. <laughs> so, so he would tell me little stories like that. And then he would get into uh, some more stories about uh, his experiences. But what I and Steve would talk about, he says, where is all this oral history of Nez Perce uh, history? Does it match up with what you see in books about Lewis and Clark? You know, you read the books, you know, they kind of glorify and embellish, you know, the opening of the West, the exploration and discovery and manifest destiny. What my father would tell me wouldn't match up with what I was reading or learning in school. So I said, well, we should do something about this. And then uh, I and Steve would sit down and talk about it. And he said, yeah, yeah, he agreed. There's this un told side of the encounter of Lewis and Clark and the Nespers, the Nipu people. What was that impression of the Nipu people when Lewis and Clark shows up? You know, and so we, we talked about this for uh, quite a while, and then we started uh, getting serious. Uh, we should go and try and find out some more information about this Lewis and Clark stuff. So he said, well, we need to talk to some of our elders that may have some information about Lewis and Clark. And there were a few that did, and others didn't. And uh, we interviewed several of our tribal people. I think it was about 13 or 14 and there were elders at the time. Some of them have already passed on, so we were lucky to interview them before they passed on. And they would have little bits and pieces of information about Lewis and Clark, particularly Watkuis, you know, the one that uh, was captured and returned back to the nest purse and swayed the argument of should we kill Lewis and Clark and that kind of stuff. But what I was finding out when I would hear and repeat the stories my father would tell me. Of course, it never matched up with any of the books. You know, Stephen Ambrose and, and uh, all the other, some of the video makers, uh, wasn't, it wasn't coming out from the tribal side. And uh, so we said, well, we got to do something, and we finally did. And uh, we recorded some of our interviews on videotape, and we got all kinds of other information that's related to tribal history and culture. So in that regard, it was also very important because they wouldn't talk specifically about Lewis and Clark, but they would talk about everything else. And then right at last, they said, oh, by the way, you know, there's a hatchet that was made by Lewis and Clark. Or, uh, yeah, there was Sacagaweas there, you know, and... And so we started collecting that. And uh, so that's the basis of our book, is trying to get that tribal perspective of the encounter with Lewis and Clark. So anyway, in addition to uh, Alan's father and, and many other people we talked to, I, uh, we, we did find a lot of material, of course, in the Lewis and Clark journals as Moulton uh, edited them. And so we looked through all those various documents that he had. We also, and I noticed something that we're missing in our bibliography, but we also used Carol McGregor's book on uh, Patrick Gass, which had uh, his journal replicated, and that was very useful. There's a local woman in Orofino, Idaho. Her name was Zoe Swain, and she collected a lot of oral history as well. 
and it's in the Clearwater County Historical Society, and much of that's been passed on to the Idaho Historical Society in Boise, and Zoe Swain is, has now passed on as well, but all of her material uh, survives, and we, we relied on that. We also found a document by an important tribal member, a guy who was actually a veteran of the 1877 war. He never did surrender. His name was Piopiotelik, and it meant bird alighting. And he took off during the last battle and escaped and lived with Sitting Bull in Canada for a couple of years. And then he came down, back down, and lived with the Spokans for a while. And then he slipped into the Nez Perce Reservation and made his home there. And he never did get uh, accosted or arrested. And uh, even though his name was on a list of people wanted for murder during the war, but of course it was war, and, uh, and the white people started it. So anyway, that was his view. And uh, he didn't die until 1935, and before he died, he made good friends with Lucullus McCorder, a, a white rancher from Yakima, Washington, and he took uh, an incredible uh, step for someone who was raised as a salmon fishing, buffalo hunting Indian. He sat down with his cousin, who was literate, and told him his story and insisted that his cousin write it down on pencil and paper. And so here's a guy who fought in almost every battle of the Nez Perce War and who was raised breaking horses and fishing for salmon and hunting buffalo. And we found that document. And actually, we found four different versions of the document. And they're in the Washington State uh, University archives in Pullman, Washington. And there was some incredible stuff in there where Patrick Gass is mentioned by name and uh, Clark and his girlfriend, who was an S purse, are mentioned specifically. And, uh, uh, and, and York is described as going down the Clearwater River in the canoe with his two Nespers girlfriends in the canoe with him, and he's singing them a song. <laughs> there are all kinds of specific little images that came out of that Pio Pio uh, document. Miley Lawyer, the great-granddaughter of Chief Lawyer and the great-great-granddaughter of Chief Twisted Hair, was our neighbor. Alan and I were both on Social Security, and we'd knock on her door, and she'd say, come on in, boys. I have some tea and cookies for you. <laughs> you know, and you're on Social Security, and this nice elderly woman calls you a boy and brings the cookie plate out. You know it's time to shut up and listen, and we did. And she just told us some incredible stories about uh, Lewis and Clark. She was one of our most interesting sources. Besides the elders we talked to, and here's another picture of Alan's father, and and this is uh, Alan's daughter, uh, Lynette, uh, at a, a gathering at Spalding, uh, Idaho. But in addition to talking to some of these elders, we also ground truth. And Alan worked for the Forest Service previously. And, and here's a picture of um, my aluminum dory, which I sold already. But anyway, it was a great little dory. And we wanted to go down into Hell's Canyon and find the spot described in Ordway's journal where they camped in Hell's Canyon. Well, it happened to be deer season, so we took our rifles along as well. This was the, an incredible afternoon, the only sunshine we had in a four-day trip. We, we picked the coldest October in the history of uh, the country. It was, it was uh, down around 10 degrees uh, most of the trip. And we froze. And if you've ever sat on an aluminum dory, you know, that's pretty cold. And it was a snow, it was a blizzard when we went over um, the pass that took us down to Hell's Canyon. And we launched the boat. And we were, uh, we were floating along, and it was so cold, and there was so much ice on the boat, we sat on our life jackets. That's not a regular thing to do, and it's not a good idea. Anyway, I like to tell this story because I like to look good, and I came out pretty good in this story because my good friend, the former chairman of the Nez Perce tribe, fell in the Snake River in Hell's Canyon. He fell over the side of the boat. There were big chunks of ice floating down the river. We were researching our book, but here he is. His glasses are gone. He's underwater. I had Three of, his student, or three of his children as my students, and I'm thinking when I see him go overboard, what am I going to tell his kids when I come out the other end of the canyon and no dad? And uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a, nearly a terrible tragedy, but I worked my way over to him, and I got him back in the boat. I saved the chairman's life.
that's not quite the way it really happened. <laughs> you know, we, we launched the boat, of course, you know, and, and uh, it was really smooth water, of course, where we, where we launched, but then downriver, just a few yards, it got a little rough. And I was sitting on the life jacket, you know, and because he told me, we better sit on the life jacket because the, the metal's cold. So I sat on the life jacket. And we went down the river a little further. And I was just about ready to say, hey, it's starting to get shallow. We hit a rock, and I fell in, and it got dumped in a river. And it, the river came up to about my waist. But as the current pushed me down the river, I got deeper and deeper <laughs> and deeper. And I thought, Steve, you better get me out of here. <laughs> And by the time he got the oar to me, I couldn't feel the bottom of the river anymore. So I, I climbed back up on it with the oar, and then, of course, it was all soaking wet, so I had to go to shore and change all my clothing. And it was, what, about 10, 12 degrees and snowing a little bit. But I survived. But in reality, this son of a gun was trying to kill me. <laughs> Later that night around the campfire, <laughs> when we began speaking again, we decided this is a perfect metaphor for what we're trying to do. It's the same story, but it looks a lot different from the boat than it does if you're in the river. <laughs> and that was, that's what we decided was the story of Lewis and Clark. We didn't, we're not telling a new story. We're telling the same old story, but... It looks different from where we are on the reservation in Idaho than it does if you're from Illinois or wherever Stephen Ambrose is from, researching documents in Washington, D.C. and telling the story of us Americans. Uh, it was one of the easiest things I ever did to, to relate uh, <clears throat> to the point of view that we're talking about because I was born in Walla Walla, and the idea of... Uh, us coming west never occurred to me. My feeling was, I'm in the west, and they came over the mountains. And that was Alan's point of view, too. And so, um, you know, it's the old story. Acculturation cuts both ways. And, and I got had as a kid, you know, I got hung up on straight arrow on the radio. And from there on, it was, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But uh, we did find a location, and we're going to show you some pictures tonight of where we believe that Ordway and Frazier and Weezer camped, and a little bit about their journey. We also, I wanted to acknowledge my wife tonight. I've never done this at one of these before, but she's here this evening. Wave, honey, to the crowd. <laughs> but she's from Kamii, born and raised in Kamii, where Lewis and Clark spent a, a month in 1806. And she's worked with the college in the, in the language program. And so we had a lot of linguistic problems that Alan and I had to work on. And she helped us unravel quite a bit of them, and we've included those in the, in the book. And her great-grandfather rode his horse all the way across Montana, rode from Kamii Valley to uh, Whitebird and to uh, uh, Lolo and, and Big Hole and through Yellowstone Park and from Laurel all the way up to uh, Bear Paws. And then he was placed on a flatbed and went down the Yellowstone and uh, <clears throat> the Missouri to Fort Abraham Lincoln and went to Oklahoma. And, uh, and so, uh, and he raised Connie's dad. And so we got a lot of information from my father-in-law as well. And so these are some of our sources that you just don't find in any archives anywhere. These are family stories from Alan's dad, from my father-in-law. <clears throat> that came straight from the sources. And I mentioned McWhorter. This is Pio Piotolek that wrote the document that Alan and I uh, located, and then in the car with him is, is this uh, Yakima rancher, Lucullus McWhorter. And it was from McWhorter that Pio Pio got the idea of tell your story and write it down so that the ages have your story. And in the back seat is McWhorter's son, uh, Virgil McWhorter. And uh, I think it's really interesting, if you look on the hood of this car, this is a, a Model T touring car, and it belonged to Pio Pio. 
And he got it from a dealer in Lewiston, Idaho, and he always ran it with his uh, medicine hide over the hood, and it was always overheating and quitting on him. <laughs> he couldn't figure it out. Well, finally, they, the dealership came and got the car. He didn't understand about the monthly payment thing. And uh, so he started out, we gave him some money, but then they got the car back. But this is the way that uh, McCorder and Piopio traveled to Montana to uh, research the battlefields that uh, were so important. But he also included in his stories all of this Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea stuff. This is another one of Alan's relatives. I'll let you tell about him. This is uh, Tumutu, and he's, men he's mentioned in uh, Lewis and Clark journals. He was a young boy, probably eight, nine years old, and he, his memory was of Sacagawea, and they called uh, Sacagawea Jane, and I think uh, Jane means young girl in French. So, so he remembered that term that they called Sacagawea. So he names his daughter Jane, and she became known as Jane Silcott because she, uh, her second marriage, she married a guy by the name of Silcott. And he ran a ferry there at Clarkston and Lewiston. And, but he's also had information uh, that, that was written down. Uh, someone had interviewed him, and, he, and one of the points that they made that he uh, remembered uh, Sacagawea. And then the, there's a little more information here because, uh, because he remembered Jane. Now, we're going to get into something a little controversial here. Uh, did, Jay, uh, did Sacagawea live to be an elderly lady, or did she die at Fort Manuel just a few years later in 1813? Well, our rendition is that she lived to be an elderly lady and was in Wyoming. And our story fits into uh, what he, he sent his daughter Jane to Wyoming to see Sacagawea. And they exchange dresses and other material and gifts. And we heard that, and they said, well, where is that dress? And we finally heard that, well, it's in Arizona. So we went down to Arizona to look for it. A guy by the name of Paul Dyke had all kinds of nest purse material. Well, he did have nest purse dresses, but it didn't have the dress. So it was just stories like that we had to chase down and we had to go all over the place to find out where, uh, try to find these items or the story. This is a photograph of Chief Lawyer. This was the great grandfather of Miley Lawyer, the nice lady that made cookies and tea for Alan and I so much. And um, his son, uh, Archie Lawyer, raised Miley Lawyer, a lot of, the, a lot of her youth, and, uh, and so he passed stories on that she passed on to us. And she was very adamant. In her house, she had a couch and a fireplace, and she said, see that couch right there? My father, Corbett Lawyer, laid right there on that couch and said, I laid in the teepee, and... My grandmother, my, my, my grandmother, lawyer's uh, wife, told me all the history of Lewis and Clark. Now I'm going to lay on the couch just like I laid in the bed when I was little by the, in the teepee and heard the story, and I'm going to tell a story to you. And she told Alan and I, I, don't, I guess I don't know the story very well, but the name of those three little boys hiding in the brush, and then she rattled off those names. And we wrote a couple of them down and lost one of them. But all three of them, she said, later became chiefs and were signers of the 1855 treaty. And sure enough, we found Chief Timothy and Chief Lawyer. Those are names way up on the list of the 1855 treaty. The first, so the, when, and we started going through the list. Almost every one of the chiefs that signed that 1855 treaty were connected to Lewis and Clark and this grand council that we're going to mention to you that occurred in, on May 12th of 1806. But there's Chief Lawyer. Both he and Timothy were photographed in Washington, D.C. Then there was a Presbyterian uh, lay minister 
He wasn't ordained, but he was a lay minister, and his name was Billy Williams. He met with an anthropologist named Alice Fletcher, one of the first female doctor uh, PhDs you know, in, in America. She was very advanced for her time, and she was a women's rights advocate, and she was uh, associated with um, the Peabody Museum in Harvard, and she came out west and did the allotment, and uh, she met Billy Williams, and she was fascinated by his stories. He, he knew lots of people that were around at the time of Lewis and Clark, and he told uh, Alice Fletcher all these stories. She wrote them down, and they're in the, the record because she used a lot of those stories in publications that she wrote. They're kind of in obscure academic journals, but uh, they've been reprinted by the University of Idaho, and, and Alan and I kind of jumped on those. And McCorder uh, photograph. this is a McCorder photograph. He photographed these two guys. This is Sam Lott and uh, Many Wounds. Now, in the Lewis and Clark journals, there's a guy named Red Grizzly. It's one of Alan's relatives again. And uh, this is the son, one of the sons of Red Grizzly. And that name, Many Wounds, there are many Nez Perces named Many Wounds. And uh, the name's been passed down uh, through the generations. But this old man lived to be 126 years old. And he told uh, McWhorter all of these war stories, war stories that went into warfare between the Nez Perce and the Cheyenne long time before, Lewis, I mean, not before Lewis and Clark, but a long time before the Nez Perce War of 77. Yet as an old man, he even fought in the War of 1877. In fact, in one retreat at the Battle of the Clearwater, this old man, he was too old to run, and everybody else was in a retreat. And so a, a, a young man had to leave the Indian lines and race across the battlefield and pick this old man up on the back of his horse under fire and uh, make their getaway. He's another guy that didn't surrender. He slipped out of camp in uh, 1877 at uh, Bear Paws and went to live with Sitting Bull in Canada. He finally died in Idaho in his sweat house in 1926. But his son, uh, who is also uh, known as Many Wounds, uh, he uh, was a, a student of the English language. He, you know, he wasn't, his English wasn't great, but I mean, you can read it, you can understand it, and he was Pio Pio's cousin. And so they sat down and they whipped out some stories and said, we want these stories to live, and, and they're in the archives at WSU, and these are the couple of fellows that are very responsible for it. Another guy with an education. This has a strong uh, Montana connection. As you know, uh, the, the Stewart brothers, Granville and what was his brother's name? Yeah, bro, James and Granville. Well, I think this was Granville's son, and it was named after his brother James uh, with a Nez Perce woman, a daughter of uh, one of the buffalo hunting chiefs. And uh, so this guy was actually born and, and raised in Montana, and then he later returned to Idaho to his mother's people. And he had a lot to say about the tribal history as well. Did you want to say anything? About uh, okay, no. well. Um, here they, uh, they've got Stewart spelled two ways. You can see down here it's James Stewart like the actor, and above it's James Stewart the way he signed his name, and that's just, I think, editorial. Tribal elder that's now passed on, his son uh, Cecil Carter was, was also one of our sources. We just had a lot of... Uh, these kinds of things. We have an ethnologist at home. His name is uh, Nakia Williamson. He's also an artist. He recreated the canoe camp that's so important in the Lewis and Clark journey. Uh, the North Fork of the, of the uh, Clearwater River there coming in, and then the main fork of the Clearwater here in the foreground. The river's running from right to left. If you looked up that canyon today, you'd see the 700-foot Dorshack Dam uh, completely blocks off. Uh, the, the canyon you're looking up. But right in the foreground was the place of the canoe camp of uh, Lewis and Clark fame. This is the dress that Alan mentioned. That dress, because Pio Pio's uh, Jane Silcott, Chief Timothy's daughter, was related to Pio Pio, and, uh, and 
and also he was cousins with Sam Lot, and Sam Lot's wife was very close with Jane Silcott, uh, Timothy's daughter. So when a very tragic accident occurred, Jane Silcott caught her dress on fire, a cotton dress, working over a wood stove, and she died five days later. This was in the 1890s. And um, so she called many of her relatives to her side while she was suffering and gave them material. And one of the things she gave them was she gave Sam Lott's wife that leather dress with all the beads on it. And she said, explained where all the beads came from. Lewis gave me these beads. Clark gave me these beads. These beads I added later. And so on and so on and so on. And anyway, um, Sam Lott then and his wife gave the dress to some cousins of theirs who ran this little museum. They were a mixed blood couple, Evanses, no relation to me, but they ran this little museum in uh, Spalding. And somebody told this woman she could put that dress on and jump in that old canoe, which was supposedly one of the canoes that went down to Celilo, but some chiefs turned around and came back in that canoe. The other canoes they continued on downstream in. And this supposedly was one of the original canoes. There was no way to prove that. But it's just a, a funky little story. And down there, that newspaper clipping, which you can't read, it says something again about this is Sacagawea's dress. There's actually a color movie of the this yes, dress. in in the Nez Perce National Historical Park in Spalding, Idaho, they have a film that somebody made, a, one of the first color films made, and there's a woman in there who is modeling this dress. And we, we took a copy of that with us and traveled around and tried to locate the dress. Of course, we ate a lot of pie and ice cream everywhere we went. That was, <laughs> that, that was part of our duties of research, but... But we have not located the dress. We've heard some stories that it might have got sold into private collection in Europe. We don't know. But that de dress to us is a document. And by the way, we found a list of items. And I think there's about 10 or 12 pages typewritten of items that Nez Perce's claimed were items received from Lewis and Clark in trade. You know, there are spoons, uh, pieces of metal, fork, hatchets, all kinds of stuff. And when this museum sold out, they advertised these items. And, and one of the advertisement lists made it to the Washington Historical Society in Tacoma. And we, we got a copy of this list. It's just unbelievable, the mass of physical items from Lewis and Clark, supposedly, that turned up on the Nez Perce Reservation. This is a photograph of, of Spalding, Idaho. You're looking right due south up Lapway Creek. This is the Clearwater River in the foreground. It runs from left, that's the left side is the Montana side and the right side is the Pacific Ocean side. So um, it looks much the same today except there's a house on the hill where the little field is and the teepees are all gone. But there are no buildings there. It's uh, a tribal boom ground, it's called. And uh, it's, it's still in tribal hands, and there are still occasional ceremonies and so on there. But it's just to give you an idea, Lewis and Clark stopped and had lunch there. You, you read the journals, it said we pulled in, and you can tell from the journal that's where they pulled in. It's right there. That's about three miles from our house. This is a this is spot was really important because this is the location of the Grand Council. The council that occurred on the um, uh, 12th of May, 1806. And we know this is the site because my father-in-law drove me up there on a county road and said, right there is where they had that council. Well, and then there's this photograph that Alan's brother gave us. And then we found out that that photograph was taken the very day of the council. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was taken in 19, oh, I think it was nine or 10, wasn't it? 
Yeah. <laughs> I, well, oh, we, I know. We don't know whether it's taken during that movie that was made. Yeah. That's that's. We think it likely was taken here. during a film that was made called Told in the Hills. And the Nez Perces played the role of another tribe of Indians for Hollywood. Co Co yeah, the Kootenai tribe. And, and the Nez Perces made a big joke of that too because Kootenai sounds an awful lot like the Nez Perce word Kootenai, which means I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so it was a joke, but they were in this film and they set the village up for the film, and so we have at least the location of where the Grand Council took place. Lewis wrote in his journal that when we arrived, uh, Chief Broken Arm had the American flag, which we'd left with him the year before. He had it planted in front of the biggest teepee in the village. So they felt very welcome coming in there. There was the American flag flying. This is another shot that was taken during the film. The tribal member who uh, was photographed in uh, regalia that harked back to an earlier time. This photo was taken by Jane Gay, who was the uh, cook and assistant to Alice Fletcher, and they were working on the allotment of the Nespers Reservation in 1889. This picture was taken. And we took this picture because a lot of people said the Nespers has never really had spotted horses, and I thought, well, and people even said when we included a spotted horse on the cover of our book, uh, that's not right. The Nez Perces really didn't have spotted horses. And, huh? What? <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> Kamii Valley. This it, is the uh, Long Camp site uh, where, where these buildings are. Used to be a uh, sawmill there. And then a railroad bridge that came across right there by the corner right there. And the sawmill covered up some of the pit houses that Lewis and Clark had camped in. They used the pits to, uh, for their camp. And one of the interesting things here that occurred is they mentioned some people they always conversed with across the river. And in the journal, they come out something like Pallet Parlor, Indians. Nez Perce. And we couldn't figure out what that meant, what they were trying to uh, talk about, uh, about these Indians that they talked with all the time. You know, Nez Perce would come across the river, or Lewis and Clark would come back over on the, uh, the, uh, on the Indian side, and they'd go back and forth. And this is, they stayed there about a month. And when we were talking to, uh, Marcus Oatman, one of our elders, he just lives up the river here, just about a oh, quarter of a mile or so, not very far. And he happened to mention, uh, he was a World War II veteran, and he was telling us some other stories about World War II, but we were there for the Lewis and Clark stuff. And he, then he finally said, oh, by the way, over there by Second Church, there's a little spring there that we call Tilaptilo. And the people that lived around the spring were Tilaptilo Poo people. And we figured, well, maybe this is something tied into this term pallet parlor Indians that they were trying to talk, you know, describe. And so he being, uh, had a lot of information about the Kamii people in the valley there. And we looked a little further and we found the tribal cemetery was called Tilaptilo also. So the Tilaptilo means little crawfish spring. In that spring, freshwater spring with little crawfishes. And so if they call Tilaptilo Poo the people that lived around the spring, this is actually the tribe or the group of people that uh, Lewis and Clark were trying to describe in our journal. So we corrected that and we said, this, it's got to be Tilaptilo people that they were talking to. And there was another other, other terms in, in the journals that you couldn't recognize it because when they heard it, 
it didn't come out in English, you know, rendition that anything that any of us could recognize. And another one was uh, Tito Harsky. It's written in a journal. You can find it in a journal, and it comes out Tito Harsky. And we couldn't figure it out. And finally, well, it, Tito, maybe that's Titoke. And Askop means uh, brother. And, and we actually, there was actually one of our leaders at that time that was called Titoke and Askop. That was his name. So he said, well, Tito Harsky must be Titoke and Askop. And so we changed it to that. And uh, so we think that's the most correct uh, term. There's other names that, uh, there was another one, Tinui Usis. Uh, they, were try they, wrote, they wrote part of it down correctly, then the rest we didn't recognize at all. And uh, another one was Cut Nose. We couldn't figure that out, but uh, uh, Cut Nose is my father's uncle. So my father would have been the great, great grandnephew of uh, cut nose. So it's things like that we also corrected and uh, tried to get it corrected from the journals and put it in the correct version in our book. And we did uh, quite a few names that way too. So, so it worked out well for that. And of course Connie helped us out quite a <laughs> bit too. We utilized, maybe some of you are not aware, there is a hist there is a dictionary out now. For a long time, there was not a consistent spelling or definition uh, tool for the Nespers language, but Haru Aoki, a linguist from Berkeley University, uh, conducted about 15 years of research and produced this dictionary, and he did it in the international phonetic language, or in, in, the, in the method of writing. And that was very, very helpful because, as Alan said, a lot of these words, they, were, they wrote things down to the strong Kentucky uh, drawl. What they heard was not what the Indians were saying. And, of course, the Indians weren't all consistent either because some of them came from Wallowa and some of them came from downstream and some of them came from upstream. And there are a lot of different dialects of the Nespers language. Uh, one of the ones that Alan didn't mention that, that I liked was... Um, Five Grizzly Hearts. And, uh, and so I forgot how Lewis and Clark had them spelled, but you, you could just, maybe he meant chachatz, pachatimina. Chachatz, pachatimina. Yeah, chachatz. Chachatz is a grizzly bear, and pachat is five, and timina is heart. And we finally figured out. They're trying to say five, chief, five gri grizzly hearts. I don't know very much about this chief, but I don't think I'd want to mess with a guy named Five <laughs> <laughs> Grizzly Hearts. But he uh, was here in this valley, and many, many other chiefs came there and visited during that 30 days. There were about, about 30 days, maybe uh, one or two, depending on if you count uh, up the creek, uh, a lawyer's creek as being in this location. It's a few miles away. But it's, you know, they were in that area for uh, more than a month, if you count the different camps that were close by here. And, and when they left, later we're going to show you pictures of the uh, Kamii Weipe Trail area. And, and when they, they left here, they, went, they worked their way up through these foothills and around here. And the trail went right through that little notch that barely shows in this photo right here. And then it swings to the north and goes to Weite Prairie, but it has to cross another really big canyon called uh, Lolo Creek Canyon. It's a different Lolo Creek than the one, of course, that comes into the Bitterroot. But as many of you know, the term Lolo mean, in Chinook jargon means a uh, uh, package, a large load to be carried on your back. And so, you know, there are different theories about where those names came from, but I know there are a lot of different Lolos around. There's a Lolo on Mount Hood, there's this Lolo Creek here. There's the Lolo Creek over in Idaho. So I don't know what the derivation of it is, but I do know that they, it's not very far from Kamii to Weipe in a straight line, 
But as everybody in Montana understands, like Idaho, a straight line ain't always the easiest way to get there. This is one of the activities that was going on there at the long camp. You know, they, they wrestled. In our book, we wrote about the Badger game. I don't want to tell you about that. It's kind of a nasty story. It involves grabbing a badger someplace I don't want to talk about. But anyway, <laughs> uh, they horse raced. They gambled. Uh, they also, this is a friend of mine. He's, he's bedridden now, unfortunately. But he used to play mountain man for the National Park Service. And I took this picture of him. Uh, probably 35 years ago, and, uh, and I said, this is, this is what happened during that long camp. And you look through the journals, there was a lot of shooting going on and a lot of gun trading, horse trading and gun trading, and uh, the Nez Perses got a pretty early reputation for uh, good marksmanship, and, and they got taught by the boys from Kentucky who knew a couple of things about shooting muzzleloaders. This is uh, one of those areas that... Some of the scholars that have reviewed our book said we made a contribution. There's Kamii, there's Weipe, the trail that I've been talking about a little bit about. It went up here and over the ridge, and, and then there's the Lolo Creek Canyon. Had to cross that and go to Weipe. Here's where the Lolo Trail took off to go uh, to Montana and, and, and Lolo Pass, Lolo Creek, and Bitterroot Valley, and so on. Uh, you know, that's the way they came over in 1805, and then they went down this way. But when they came back, uh, right in here, they, they left the river and, and came overland and down here to Kamii. Grand Council was there. The Long Camp was there. And then they found out that there were salmon coming in the river. You know, the salmon aren't in the river all the time. They migrate in. So they're in May. They're in Kamii. And they talked to some Indians up here at Kuski and said, and they had some beautiful salmon. Where did you get those? Got them over downstream and uh, they're not here yet the little bird hasn't spoke yet there was a little bird and when that bird told them that's when the fish were going to come when that bird showed up and sang his little song get ready the salmon are going to be there they hadn't sang their song yet and uh, but they had salmon remains there so Lewis and Clark sent these guys Ordway was the sergeant and Frazier and Weezer were privates and they said it's going to take you half a day to get there so go get some fish and then come back. Well, they were gone for a week. And uh, quite a story. I won't go into it. But uh, a lot of people see things differently. Uh, you know, uh, Sergeant Ordway, I don't know if you remember this, but Sergeant Ordway had already been in trouble in one of the Lakota village, or no, in the Mandan village. He had a little hot thing going with uh, a pretty Mandan girl, except that she also had a husband. And uh, so we think there was some shenanigans going on in this trip as well for a lot of reasons. It dovetailed nicely with an aspect of tribal culture, which was you didn't trade with somebody unless you had a relationship with them. You had to have some kind of relationship. And one of the highest relationships was a marriage relationship. And so if there was a strong attac attraction and if there was a political long-range diplomatic benefit, like children who would learn to speak both languages and who would be welcome in both camps, you had a peacemaker, a trader, a traveler, somebody, then it was okay to get married for the weekend. <laughs> or as Connie's uncle Kevin likes to say, it was a true love, a deep love, the kind of love that would last the entire basketball tournament. <laughs> but anyway, this is the... Kamii, and they, they kind of retract their, their journey. You know, it was about 900 feet up out of this little canyon here, and then they went by across, and this is called Camas Prairie. There's Lewiston, by the way, and here's the, the Clearwater River running west. And here's the uh, Snake River running to the Columbia. Snake River here is running north. It's running right the way the little red dot's going. But the Salmon River's down here, and it's running generally west actually goes south a little bit, but it's generally traveling across Idaho and dumps into the river right there. So they came out here to this canyon. This is very deep canyon. This is like 5,000 feet deep, this canyon. It's, it's as deep as Grand Canyon is in places. So, and then they, they went in here, and then they, they couldn't go down the Salmon River anymore. This is for five, the last five miles of Salmon River. 
It's bluffs on both sides. You can run it in a jet boat and a rubber boat, but you can't go there any other way. And so they, they had horses. They had uh, Chief Twisted Hair was showing them how to get there. They got down in here. There was no salmon in the Salmon River yet, so they had to cross this ridge, 4,000-foot ridge, Wapshili Ridge, and down here is where Alan and I found the remains of where the longhouse was that they described in the journal. We think we found the right place, and, and a lot of people are agreeing with us. Some people aren't. But this is uh, Lawyer's Creek Canyon. This is the little canyon that they had to work their way out of. Then they went across the prairie, and there's a little sign along the highway, 95, that tells about it. And uh, it was here. I have this Spanish mill dollar here. This is one of the things they found. The Indians had this in camp, and, and, Ray, and Frazier had a razor, and he traded his razor for two of these Spanish dollars that the Indians had, and he asked them where they got them, and they said, the Shoshones had them around their neck, so we killed them and took them. <laughs> okay. And that's me at the top of the ridge. This is Salmon River in the, in the background. Alan dro had dropped me off up here. There's a Jeep trail out to this point. And then he, he raced around and went down to the bottom with the ice chest and his girlfriend and waited for me while I went down the ridge here and took the pictures. There was a lot of rattlesnakes there. That's why I didn't go down with you. <laughs> he knows I just love rattlesnakes. You take the pictures. I'll wait for you down at the beach. Okay. But it shows the canyon there, and, and then when they got down to the bottom, they went along the river, and they had to, this ridge right here, they had to cross that ridge, and the bluffs I was talking about was way down here. So they, they went down to the bottom, they get down here, then they go up, and they cross this ridge, and then down, and this is Hell's Canyon, on the, that's the bottom end of Hell's Canyon, and the Snake River is running from left, the south, to the north, to the right. This ridge here is... Uh, called Hoover Ridge, and it, it divides um, Deer Crip from uh, another creek. The name slips me right now. But it just gives you an idea what the country looks like. This is, this is where they, they rode their horses either down the creek bottom or along. I'm on a trail here. The trail goes right over that rock. And then uh, this is one of the few areas in the lower Salmon Gorge where you could actually ride a horse right along the river. And there's a little Jeep trail down there. Alan was right there with, um, they had their picnic and everything, and I was up here, I didn't have a picnic, but he was down there with the, his girlfriend and the picnic, I hated that part, but anyway. This is looking due south from the Wapshili Ridge, the ridge that, that, that Lewis and Clark's people had to cross. This side, this in the shade over here, this is the Salmon River side of the ridge, this side over here is the Snake River side of the ridge. And the, river, the, the Salmon River goes down the very end of this ridge and, and around the end and then turns and comes north. So the river's running south, runs into the Snake River, then runs north. These mountains right here are the Seven Devils Mountains. And from there you can just about see Weezer on a really clear day, Weezer, Idaho. So it gives you an idea. This is Wallowa County, Oregon over here. And this is Wapshili Ridge, Idaho. It's nine miles long out this ridge. And it's, this, it just a, it's just a kind of a, you know, a, a bare ridge that, I mean, it's really a divide. Alan is standing right there. You can barely see him. He's gone on Levi's and a white T-shirt. And, and the trail that comes down there, yeah. that's... That's the trail that we think, and, uh, and we pretty well proved that this trail went down to Cougar Bar, to where Ordway and them had, you know, traded for salmon down there. And uh, this is the Cougar Bar, and this uh, this area reminded uh, Ordway and his uh, t companions of Salilo. Because it was there was promontories out in the middle of the river and and bluff and uh, little black eddies just like Salilo, and so in their journal that they they said that it reminded them of Salilo Falls, and on this flat here there's a lot of pit houses, and there's one particular one that we were looking for, 
Oh, <laughs> this one right here. Yeah. We believe this is the one pit house that was described in the Lewis and Clark journals. It's a, the dimensions are the same that they describe in the journals. And there's three other little pit yes, houses or pit areas one over there. in the same little flat. And so we're pretty confident that this is the pit house that they described. And we, we, we would go up there, and I was asked, well, why would they have a pit house up this draw? It was about, what, 300, 350 yards from the river. And, and we were touring that site, and I said, raise your hand. So people raised their hand. Feel that breeze. That's drying the salmon that they had on racks at that pit house. That's why that pit house was there. And uh, this, when we came, I and Steve came down in a drift boat, we started to see these uh, rams. He says, well, this must be the place where Ordway <laughs> described seeing rams. Oh, this has got to be the Lewis and Clark site also. And just around the bend a little bit was uh, uh, Cougar Bar. I would call this the KW Trail because uh, Kamii Weipe. So, but this is the crossing of the uh, Lolo Creek, Idaho's Lolo Creek. And we know this is the exact spot because that photograph we showed you earlier of James Stewart. James Stewart uh, befriended Olin D. Wheeler. Olin D. Wheeler was a railroad surveyor and amateur historian. And they got to be buddies, and uh, Wheeler decided to write a book about Lewis and Clark. And uh, so Stuart told him, well, then you better go see the trail that they left Kamei on and went over to Weipe on. And he took him to this spot. And in Olin Wheeler's book, that rock is very prominent in the photograph of the crossing. And now there is a county bridge right above that rock. And... Alan and I walked that trail from the top to the bottom one day, and that trail is is so deep, it, it's up to your waist in places. I mean, it was you could go along there, and, and the, the stories that we've heard, too, is that they'd see, some people would see some Indians going along and look just like their, their horse's head and their shoulders and head just moving, and they'd go up there on the ridge, and the horse's trail is so deep that the, the Indian women could just step off their horse you know, right onto the side of the trail. It was, those trails were really deep. And these trail, the trail that came down off of that ridge and, and hit this county road is, is like that. Even though there's trees growing and everything, I mean, you couldn't miss it if you wanted to. You know, you could, you could go come down there in the dark by feel. So we know this is the spot, and, and Olin Wheeler has it in his book, and there's the, the rock in there. And this is going up the other side. This is not very far from Weite Prairie. This is after you come out of Lolo Creek. This is actually looking towards Montana. So we're looking at the Clearwater Mountains here and beyond that, the, you know, the Bitterroots. They hook up with the Bitterroots. And this fella here is a game warden that was in, lived in that area. And he knew the trail very well. And, and that's how we located it was by uh, our friend, uh, Gene Eastman was his name and his wife Molly, and there's Molly there. And uh, this is actually a, little, a few miles beyond where the last photograph was taken. And this is Weite Prairie. And this is where, in 1805, Clark came out and, you know, stumbled into the camps of the Nez Perce, and the Nez Perces were going to kill him. But this one woman who had been befriended by white people and had been helped by white people raised the flap of the and said, these people are the ones I was telling you about. These people got a lot of good things, and then some of these people are probably really nice people because they saved me one time. These white people are nice people. And so they, the guys who were back in the brush with their bowstrings strung and their arrows ready, uh, they backed off until the chiefs, were, the chiefs were mostly gone at that time. They were on a retaliatory raid down south against the Shoshones, and so here these guys show up, I mean, in the whole American West at that time, there were probably only 25 rifles or 30 rifles, and Lewis and Clark people had them all. 
And these guys, their best warriors weren't even around, so they decided, okay, let's just cool down and wait till later. Wat Kuis was closely related to Chief Red Bear, and he was the war leader, and he was gone. And she said, don't hurt him. So they just uh, decided to wait and see what happened, and it turned out you know, very happily for Lewis and Clark, and mostly happy for the Nez Perce for many, many years until, of course, the tragedy of the 1877 war. Molly and Jean helped us a lot, and we've acknowledged them, and there's their picture. And Al? Uh, this is uh, William Clark's son. <gasps> no. He, he was... Yes. Halach took it. What? He, William Clark had a son? Amongst yeah. the Nez Perces? Man. You won't read it in history books, but... Oh. There he is. <laughs> this is taken along the Yellowstone. Uh, I can't remember the name of the photographer, but he was posed with a rifle. And uh, how, how we know that he is Clark's son is that it's mentioned in oral history that Clark, William Clark had a son, and also York. And he is. The reason he exists is because the alliance building mechanism is getting leadership, you know, men and women together to have a child, and that child becomes the relationship builder. You know, learning two languages most, most of the time. And it's done for a very practical reason. You know, to keep peace and uh, friendship among leadership. And if you do that with a young, and uh, at this time he's about, oh, this would have been about uh, just before the war of 77, probably about 73, so he would have been uh, in his approaching 70 years old. And his name is Halak Tukit because we called William Clark Halak Tukit. And that means daytime smoker. And, because, and probably because of William Clark's habit for smoking and also smoking the pipe with uh, trying to build relationships too. And he lived to go through the 1877 war. And of course, hopefully, the reason that he was uh, created was that he could have been a peacemaker. And but his he wasn't that prominent. You know, he was well known, but he wasn't prominent. And we find a little bits and pieces of information of him. And but he went through the war of 1877, survived all the battles, ended up in Oklahoma in exile, and he dies in Oklahoma. So he he didn't uh, live or survive the war, but he just died of old age, I believe. And so uh, those are the two, uh, two descendants among the Nespers is from Clark and from York. York probably had more descendants along the trail than anybody else <laughs> because he was a curiosity. Well, women found out, is he really a human being? And the way to find that out, of course, is <laughs> does he function as a human being? So, uh, so that was another relationship building. You know, you get young children there; they're relationship builders, and uh, so that's the story of William Clark. This is our last uh, photograph for this evening, and we sure appreciate you uh, being here. One of the most difficult parts of our book was wrapping it up. Our editor said you have to write something about after Lewis and Clark because we did the Lewis and Clark amongst the Nez Perces. So we wrote one more chapter, and we sent it to him, and they said, oh, you've got to tone this down. And we said, uh, this is the toned-down version. <laughs> and anyway, it was very difficult to wrap up the last 200 years in a summary way, and, uh, uh, but we did that, and uh, one of the things we stumbled into while we were messing around, uh, doing, you know, continuing and to edit and wrap things up, 
this photograph of the Kamii Valley taken 100 years after Lewis and Clark. And the thing that struck us about it, the more we looked at it, was the existence right here. This is the site of the old Tilapalo village, the uh, small crayfish spring village people. And this is the church uh, called Second Church, Second Indian Presbyterian Church, started by Archie Lawyer, the son of Chief Lawyer, who went to Oklahoma as a Presbyterian minister to his relatives who had fought in the war and, and whose uh, granddaughter, uh, Miley, told us all about it. And uh, he was also the first minister here. And these people here uh, were all uh, Nespers people who lived in a village uh, by the church. And these people here are the white people who moved into Kamii. Uh, and so 100 years after the really good relationship, working relationship that Lewis and Clark and the Nez Perses had, things kind of went rapidly downhill when the Nez Perses became the minority and the non-Indians became the majority. This, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, is a segregated village. The Indian people lived here. The white people lived here. This continued on into the 50s. My wife's sister went to the public swimming pool about 1949 or 1950, and uh, uh, most of the Indians swam in the river. She went to the swimming pool to swim with her other friends, her white friends from Kamii High School, and was told, you people go to the river to swim. You don't swim in the public pool. And, uh, this, and this attitude continued way deep into the 50s. And, uh, you know, some say, you know, that it's still lingering around, although it's uh, fast fading with the young people. But recently, the Kamii High School had a, Native American principal, and she got fired about three days in the job. She, had a, she taught everybody to say, Tots may we. Uh, it means good morning in Nespers language. And the, somebody in the district said, we don't teach our kids anything but English around here. Down the road, sister. Anyway, we don't know the details of it. It's all in the courts. Read about it in the papers. But anyway, we sure enjoyed being here tonight, and thank you very much. We're going to take any questions you have, or if you need to go, of course, we understand. If you don't and you want to talk to Alan and I, we're going to hang around and try and answer your questions. Thank you.